if I told you that the world we see is only a fraction of the reality we exist in? Behind every action, every thought, there is a battle being fought in realms we can't see. A silent war between the forces of good and evil. And at the heart of this conflict are beings the Bible calls demons. They're not just relics of ancient superstition. They are real, and their influence can be felt all around us. From the shadows, they plot, deceive, and attack, striving to turn us away from the light and plunge us into darkness. But this isn't a story of hopelessness. Far from it. Because once we learn to recognize their presence and understand their methods, we can defend ourselves and fight back. Demons operate with one goal, to harm and mislead. But their power is limited, and they can be overcome. Today, we'll dive deep into how these beings affect our daily lives, often in ways we don't even realize. Welcome back, Celestial Seekers. It's always great to have you here as we uncover the hidden truths and explore the mysteries that shape our world. If you're new to the channel, make sure to hit that subscribe button and join the discussion below as we journey into the spiritual realm together. Let's explore the unseen war, and more importantly, how we can be prepared to face it. Demons aren't just interested in individual lives. Their reach extends to societies, cultures, and belief systems. They seek to influence not only our personal decisions, but also the course of human history. Every time a nation rises or falls into chaos, every time truth is distorted into a lie, these spiritual forces are at work behind the scenes. But how exactly do they do this? How do demons, as spiritual beings, manage to exert such control in the physical world? It starts with deception. One of their greatest tactics is to make you believe they don't exist at all. The more we live our lives unaware of their presence, the more vulnerable we are to their attacks. You see, the battlefield of the mind is where they thrive, planting seeds of doubt, fear, and confusion. Have you ever had an overwhelming sense of dread or persistent negative thoughts that seem to come from nowhere? These might be subtle, but they could be signs of something more than just stress or anxiety. Consider the small, insidious ways they operate, making a person question their self-worth, encouraging behaviors that lead to destruction, or simply driving a wedge between you and God. Sometimes it's as simple as a whisper of fear, other times it's a flood of temptation. They play on our weaknesses, exploiting the very things that make us human. And it doesn't stop there. Demons also affect relationships. Marriages, friendships, and families are frequent targets because they represent God's design for love, unity, and community. Think about the number of conflicts that seem to erupt out of nowhere. What if these are more than just miscommunication? What if they are carefully orchestrated disruptions designed to tear people apart? Now, I want to hear from you. Have you ever felt like there was an unseen force working against you, especially in moments of weakness or when trying to do good? Share your thoughts in the comments and let's unravel these mysteries together. Long before humanity existed, an ancient rebellion took place in the heavens. This rebellion wasn't between armies or nations, but between celestial beings, angels who once served God. The leader of this uprising was none other than Lucifer, the most beautiful and powerful of all angels. His fall from grace is one of the most significant moments in the spiritual history of the universe, and it set the stage for the existence of demons as we know them today. Lucifer's story begins with his pride. He wasn't satisfied with being a servant of God, even though he held an exalted position in heaven. Lucifer desired more. He wanted to be like God, to sit on the highest throne and rule over everything. His pride led him to convince a third of the angels to join him in this rebellion. Together, they believed they could overthrow God and seize control of the heavens. But their rebellion was short-lived. God, in his supreme power, cast Lucifer and his followers out of heaven. This dramatic fall from glory transformed them from angels of light into the dark, twisted beings we now call demons. Lucifer, who had once been a bearer of light, became Satan, the adversary of God and all that is good. The angels who followed him became his demonic army, bound to his wicked purpose of opposing God's plan for creation. So how did these fallen beings go from rebellious angels to the demons that torment humanity? Once cast out of heaven, they lost their former beauty and power, becoming corrupt and malicious. 
their goal shifted from ruling heaven to seeking revenge against God by attacking His most precious creation, humanity. This desire to corrupt and destroy is at the core of everything demons do. Some ancient texts, especially the book of Genesis, provide additional clues to the origins of demons. In Genesis 6, we read about the sons of God, who took human women as wives and produced offspring known as the Nephilim, a race of giants. Some scholars believe that these sons of God were fallen angels, and their offspring, the Nephilim, became part of the demonic realm after their destruction during the flood. This theory suggests that demons could be the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, cursed to roam the earth and carry out the will of Satan. The Bible doesn't give a complete explanation of these events, but it's clear that demons are deeply tied to the spiritual rebellion against God. Their hatred for humanity stems from their hatred of God. They can no longer harm God directly, so they seek to harm those created in His image, us. It's important to remember that while demons are powerful, they are not equal to God. They are fallen, defeated beings, ultimately limited in what they can do. God remains in control, and even in their rebellion, demons cannot escape His authority. We see this clearly in the Bible when Jesus encounters demons. They tremble at His presence and obey His commands without question. But this raises an important question. Why does God allow them to continue their work on earth? Could it be that their presence serves a greater purpose in the grand scheme of free will and spiritual growth? Let's think about that together. Why do you think demons are still active in the world today? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments below as we continue to explore this fascinating topic. Demons come in many forms, and the Bible hints at different types with distinct roles and purposes. These spiritual beings are not all the same. Their methods, goals, and ways of influencing humanity vary widely. Understanding the different types of demons can help us recognize their attacks and defend ourselves against their influence. One of the most commonly mentioned demons in the Bible are unclean spirits. These demons are often associated with sin, impurity, and moral corruption. The Gospels frequently mention Jesus casting out unclean spirits from people, freeing them from spiritual bondage. These spirits seem to thrive in places where sin and darkness are prevalent, latching onto human weakness. They stir up desires for things that corrupt the soul, pushing people toward destructive behaviors like addiction, lust, violence, and anger. They don't always cause dramatic possessions, but they can quietly influence thoughts, leading people away from righteousness. Then we have spirits of infirmity. These demons are specifically connected to physical illness and suffering. In the Bible, we see examples of people who are afflicted by diseases or disabilities that have a spiritual root. In Luke 13, 11 to 13, Jesus heals a woman who had been crippled for 18 years, explaining that she was bound by a spirit of infirmity. While not every sickness is caused by a demon, the Bible makes it clear that some ailments can be the direct result of demonic oppression. These spirits target the body, weakening individuals physically in order to wear them down spiritually and emotionally. Deceiving spirits are another powerful type of demon. Their role is to spread lies and false beliefs, leading people away from God's truth. These demons work behind the scenes, sowing seeds of confusion and promoting false doctrines. They are masters of disguise, often presenting themselves as beings of light or even using elements of truth to sell a larger lie. Deceiving spirits are particularly dangerous because they can cause entire groups of people to stray from the faith. The Apostle Paul warns about them in 1 Timothy 4.1, saying, The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. These demons don't just influence individuals, they can twist entire cultures or religious movements, making them drift away from the core truths of God. Another type that is often hinted at in scripture is territorial spirits. These demons seem to have authority over certain areas or regions. In Daniel 10, the angel sent to deliver a message to Daniel is delayed by a demonic figure referred to as the Prince of Persia. This suggests that some demons are assigned to specific locations or nations, working to influence the spiritual atmosphere of entire regions. They might stir up conflict, 
promote evil governments or create cultural norms that go against God's will. These spirits can be difficult to recognize because their influence is more subtle, embedded in societal structures and regional attitudes. Lastly, we have familiar spirits. These are demons that often work closely with individuals, sometimes masquerading as loved ones or spiritual guides. They are called familiar because they seem to form a relationship with the person they are targeting, sometimes even gaining the trust of their victim. They can appear in various forms, including in dreams or visions, pretending to be ancestors, deceased relatives, or wise spirits offering advice. However, their true intention is to deceive and lead people into practices like witchcraft, divination, or other occult activities. This is why God strictly forbids seeking guidance from such spirits, as seen in Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 12. Understanding these different types of demons helps us become more aware of how they may be working in our lives or the world around us. They operate in various ways, from influencing individuals through temptation or illness, to spreading false teachings, or even controlling the direction of entire nations. The key to defending against them is to stay close to God, live according to His Word, and remain spiritually alert. Demons don't always reveal themselves in obvious ways. In fact, one of their most effective strategies is to operate unnoticed, influencing people's lives in ways that seem natural or purely psychological. To understand how they work, we need to look closely at the tactics they use to deceive, manipulate, and attack us spiritually, mentally, and even physically. One of the primary ways demons attack is through thoughts and temptations. They are experts at planting ideas in our minds that lead us away from God's truth. These thoughts can be subtle, like feelings of doubt or fear that seem to come out of nowhere. You might suddenly feel unworthy, unloved, or too sinful to be forgiven. Thoughts that can spiral into despair. Sometimes it's a temptation that plays on your personal weaknesses, offering you what seems like an easy way out or a quick path to satisfaction, even though it's against God's will. Think about how often we're tempted to lie, gossip, or indulge in things that we know aren't good for us. Demons know our weak points and will use them to make us stumble. They don't force us to do wrong, but they create the opportunity, making sin look appealing or even justifiable. This tactic is so effective because it disguises the spiritual attack as a personal choice. We often don't realize we're being influenced at all. Another common way demons operate is through spiritual oppression. This is different from possession, where a demon takes direct control of a person's body. In oppression, demons attack from the outside, putting pressure on a person's life through overwhelming fear, anxiety, or depression. It's like a dark cloud that follows you everywhere, making everything seem hopeless. You might feel constantly weighed down, emotionally drained, or as if there's something blocking you from feeling God's presence. This can happen especially during times of spiritual growth or when you're trying to make positive changes in your life. In these situations, demons seek to wear you down and distract you from your faith. They create an atmosphere of negativity that can lead to isolation, self-doubt, and a loss of spiritual motivation. The goal is to keep you from praying, worshiping, or even believing that God cares about you. Demons also attack through physical illness and suffering. As we mentioned earlier, not all sickness comes from demons, but there are cases in the Bible where physical afflictions are linked to demonic activity. For example, in the Gospel of Mark, we read about a boy possessed by a demon who caused him to have seizures, throw himself into fire, and suffer greatly. Jesus, of course, casts out the demon and the boy is healed. This shows us that demons can target the body as a way to weaken the spirit. When illness is caused by a demon, it's not just about the physical symptoms. It's the mental and emotional toll it takes on a person. The sense of hopelessness that can make them question God's goodness. Some people battle with conditions that seem to defy medical explanation, or they experience a constant barrage of illnesses that prevent them from living fully or serving God effectively. While modern medicine helps in many ways, there are some battles that need to be fought spiritually as well. Then there's the most dramatic form of attack, demonic possession. This is where a demon takes full control of a person's body, speaking and acting through them. Possession is rare but extremely serious. 
and the Bible gives us several examples of Jesus and his disciples casting out demons from possessed individuals. Those who are possessed often lose control of their behavior, experiencing violent outbursts, self-destructive actions, or an aversion to anything holy. Possession is the ultimate expression of demonic control, and it requires the intervention of someone with spiritual authority, usually through prayer, fasting, and invoking the name of Jesus. It's important to note that possession doesn't just happen to anyone. It usually occurs in cases where people have opened themselves up to dark spiritual practices, such as occult rituals, witchcraft, or the worship of false gods. This is why scripture warns so strongly against engaging with these things. They create an opening for demonic influence. Lastly, demons often work through relationships and circumstances. They stir up conflict, misunderstanding, and division, especially within families, friendships, or churches. Have you ever noticed how some arguments seem to come out of nowhere, escalating quickly over something trivial? Demons thrive in conflict because it creates an atmosphere of anger, bitterness, and unforgiveness, all of which can separate people from each other and from God. They also use life circumstances to break people down. Unexpected tragedies, financial struggles, or sudden misfortune can make people feel as though God has abandoned them. In these moments, demons whisper lies, convincing people that they are alone, that God doesn't care, or that it's pointless to keep believing. Their goal is always the same, to turn people away from God by making them question His goodness or His power. Understanding these tactics is the first step in fighting back. The more aware we are of how demons operate, the better equipped we are to recognize their attacks and defend ourselves. It's not about living in fear, but about being spiritually prepared. What kinds of attacks have you noticed in your own life or in the world around you? How do you think we can best defend ourselves from these unseen forces? Let's talk about it in the comments. When we talk about spiritual warfare, we're talking about a battle that's been going on since the beginning of time, a battle between good and evil, light and darkness. But unlike physical warfare, where armies fight with weapons and strategies, spiritual warfare happens in a realm that we cannot see with our eyes. It's a fight against invisible forces like demons, and while we might not be able to see them, the Bible makes it clear that we are not defenseless. God has given us specific tools and weapons to stand strong and fight back. One of the most important tools in this battle is the armor of God. In Ephesians 6, 10 to 18, the Apostle Paul gives us a clear picture of how to equip ourselves for spiritual warfare. He compares it to a suit of armor that a soldier would wear into battle, but each piece has a spiritual meaning and purpose. The Belt of Truth This is the first piece of armor Paul mentions, and it's no coincidence that truth is at the center of it all. Demons work by spreading lies and deception, so the best defense is holding on to the truth of God's Word. Knowing what is true helps us see through the enemy's lies. When we are grounded in the truth, we can stand firm even when everything around us tries to pull us away from God. The Breastplate of Righteousness The breastplate protects our hearts, both physically and spiritually. Righteousness means living in a way that is pleasing to God, making choices that reflect His will. When we live righteously, we close off opportunities for demons to attack us through guilt, shame, or sin. They thrive in darkness, but righteousness keeps our hearts guarded and pure. The Shoes of the Gospel of Peace Just as shoes prepare us to move forward, the Gospel of Peace prepares us to stand firm and share the message of God's love. Demons want to create chaos, fear, and confusion, but the peace of God brings calm and stability. When we carry that peace, it not only protects us, but also helps us spread God's kingdom, which weakens the power of the enemy. The Shield of Faith Faith is a powerful defense against the attacks of demons. Paul describes faith as a shield that can extinguish the fiery arrows of the evil one. Those arrows can come in the form of doubts, fears, or temptations. But when we hold up the Shield of Faith, we trust in God's promises and His protection, knowing that no matter what happens, He is in control. The Helmet of Salvation The helmet protects our minds. Demons often attack our thoughts, planting seeds of doubt and confusion. The helmet of salvation reminds us that we belong to God, that we are saved through Jesus Christ, and that our eternal destiny is secure.
This knowledge protects us from fear and helps us keep our focus on God's plan for our lives. The Sword of the Spirit. This is the only offensive weapon in the armor, and it is described as the Word of God. Just like Jesus used scripture to fight off Satan's temptations in the wilderness, we can use God's Word to cut through the lies and attacks of demons. The Bible is not just a book of stories. It's a powerful weapon that, when spoken and believed, can drive away the forces of darkness. In addition to the armor of God, prayer is one of the most powerful tools we have in spiritual warfare. Prayer isn't just about asking God for things. It's about communicating with Him, aligning our hearts with His, and drawing on His strength. In James 4, 7, we are told, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Through prayer, we submit ourselves to God, asking for his guidance and protection, and it strengthens our ability to resist the devil. But prayer goes beyond just protecting ourselves. Through prayer, we can intercede for others, our families, our friends, even our communities. When we pray for those who are being oppressed or attacked by demons, we invite God's power into their lives. Prayer has the ability to break strongholds, restore peace, and drive away the enemy's influence. It's one of the most direct ways we can engage in spiritual warfare. Another tool that's often overlooked is fasting. Fasting, combined with prayer, has been used throughout the Bible as a way to focus spiritually and draw closer to God. Jesus himself fasted for 40 days in the wilderness before facing Satan's temptations. In Mark 9, 29, when the disciples couldn't cast out a particularly strong demon, Jesus said, This kind can come out only by prayer and fasting. Fasting helps us humble ourselves before God, clear away distractions, and become more sensitive to His presence. In doing so, we also strengthen our spiritual defenses against demonic attacks. One of the most powerful aspects of spiritual warfare is the authority given to us through Jesus Christ. When Jesus walked the earth, he had absolute authority over demons. Every time he encountered them, they were forced to submit to his command. And before he ascended to heaven, he passed that authority on to his followers. In Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. This means that as believers, we don't have to be afraid of demons. In the name of Jesus, we have the authority to rebuke them cast them out, and command them to leave. But this authority isn't something we can use carelessly. It's rooted in our relationship with Christ and our faith in His power. When we rely on Him, we can confidently stand against any attack from the enemy. The battle between good and evil is not just an ancient story. It's an ongoing struggle that affects each of us every day. This spiritual war is real, and while demons try to pull us away from God, the victory has already been secured through Jesus Christ. But what does that victory mean for us today? And how do we live it out in our daily lives? First, it's important to understand that Jesus' victory over demons is absolute. When he died on the cross and rose again, he broke the power of sin and death, not just for himself, but for all of humanity. This victory wasn't just over physical death. It was a triumph over the spiritual forces that have been waging war against God and His creation since the beginning of time. In Colossians 2.15, Paul writes, Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. This means that Satan and his demons were utterly defeated by Christ's sacrifice. They may still be active in the world, but their ultimate defeat is already sealed. So if Christ has already won, why do we still feel the effects of spiritual warfare? Why do demons still seem to have influence? It's because we are living in what many call the already but not yet period. Jesus has already defeated the enemy, but until his final return, we are still in a world where spiritual battles continue. This is why we must stay vigilant, understanding that while the war is won, the skirmishes continue. One of the most comforting aspects of this truth is that we don't fight for victory we fight from victory. In other words, we're not trying to win a battle that's up in the air. The victory is already ours in Christ. Our role is to stand firm in that victory, using the tools and authority he has given us to resist the enemy's attacks. But how do we live out this victory in practical ways? 
One of the most powerful steps we can take is to claim the authority that Jesus has given us. This is not about arrogance or thinking we're stronger than demons on our own. It's about standing in the power of Jesus' name. When we pray or speak against demonic forces, we do so in the authority of Christ, not in our own strength. This is why even though demons may try to influence us, they tremble at the name of Jesus. They know that his name represents their ultimate defeat. Another key to living out this victory is walking closely with God. The more we immerse ourselves in his presence, through prayer, reading scripture, and worship, the stronger we become spiritually. Demons thrive in spiritual weakness, but when we are filled with God's spirit, they have no hold over us. Psalm 91.1 says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. When we stay close to God, we are protected from the enemy's attacks. It's also important to understand that demons feed off fear. They want to paralyze us with fear, making us doubt God's power and love. But as 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 reminds us, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. The more we rely on God, the less power fear has over us. Instead of letting fear control us, we can confront it with faith, knowing that God is greater than any force that comes against us. In addition to resisting fear, it's crucial to forgive and let go of bitterness. Demons often exploit our unresolved anger and grudges. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27 warns, In your anger, do not sin and do not give the devil a foothold. Holding on to unforgiveness gives the enemy a way into our hearts and lives. When we forgive others and release bitterness, we close the door on demonic influence and allow God's peace to fill us. One of the most encouraging truths is that we are never alone in this battle. Not only do we have the Holy Spirit living within us, guiding and strengthening us, but we also have a community of believers who are fighting alongside us. As we mentioned earlier, fellowship is a powerful weapon in spiritual warfare. When we pray for each other, encourage one another, and stand together in faith, we become a united front that is harder for the enemy to penetrate. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. There is strength in numbers, and the enemy knows it. Finally, we must remember that our victory is not just for ourselves. Jesus calls us to be light in a world filled with darkness. As we stand firm in the victory he has won for us, we are called to help others find freedom from the forces that seek to enslave them. This means sharing the gospel, praying for those who are oppressed, and offering hope to those who are struggling. Spiritual warfare isn't just about defending ourselves, it's about advancing God's kingdom and rescuing others from the clutches of the enemy. As we live out this victory, we will face challenges. The enemy will try to discourage us, deceive us, and drag us back into fear and sin. But the truth remains, Christ has already won. When we trust in him, use the tools he has given us, and stand together as his followers, we can live in the freedom and power that his victory provides. So, as we wrap up this exploration of spiritual warfare, let's ask ourselves, how are we living out the victory that Christ has already won? What areas of our lives might still be under attack? And how can we stand stronger in faith? I invite you to share your thoughts in the comments below. Let's continue the conversation, supporting and encouraging each other as we walk in the victory that has already been secured through Jesus.